This is the Reformed Libertarians Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute with Kerry Baldwin and Gregory Baus. We explore free society from a Reformed perspective. You can find us at reformedlibertarians.com. We talk about culture, society, politics, economics, theology, philosophy, worldview, and more, helping those interested in liberty and human flourishing to think about them based in the Reformed faith. This is episode five. We're discussing objections to non-monopolist or stateless civil governance, part two. I'm Gregory Baus here with Kerry Baldwin, and we'll be talking about this second in a series of four articles written by Kerry. In this article, she addresses objections related to human sinfulness and the question of the state's necessity. We'll link to the article in the show notes. As always, it's published at the Libertarian Christian Institute's website, libertarianchristians.com, and it's less than a 10-minute read. Yeah, so part one was concerning law and order and the question of the state's legitimacy. And we discussed that way back in episode three. And then parts three and four on questions pertaining to the inevitability and plausibility of stateless civil governance, those are planned for future episodes. Now, Carrie, you have a sort of preface to all four of your articles that says, while you believe minarchist libertarians who hold to the legitimacy of a minimal or strictly limited state and anarchist libertarians like us, who hold to the need for stateless civil governance can cooperate in pursuit of a free society. Nevertheless, the disagreement between these respective positions is worth considering. So before we jump into the main points of this article, can you give us an overview of what you say there? Yeah, so I begin with this crucial acknowledgement that as Christians, we know we're all sinners and we live in a fallen world. So there are and always will be criminals. And a functioning society needs to deal with that by way of civil governance. That is an administration of civil justice by responsive coercion. So I go on to examine the claim that this necessitates civil governance by the state. Even if we don't like the state or the state behaves badly at some times, Some people believe that it's still necessary, the state is still necessary because the alternatives are worse. So throughout the rest of the article, I explain that the state increases the destructive potential of sin rather than decreasing it or mitigating it. And then lastly, I summarize why human sinfulness is actually a reason against having a state and a reason for stateless civil governance. Let's consider this first point about everyone being a sinner and our not having any illusions about that or about what that means for any functioning society. In your first article about law and order and the question of the legitimacy of the state, you consider several points from John Locke. Here, you mention Federalist Paper 51, likely by James Madison. Yes, so this is one well-known passage and it says this, quote, If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed and in the next place, oblige it to control itself, end quote. So Madison's argument here favoring the necessity of the state goes something like this. Since humans are not angels, that is, humans are not perfect, subject to sin, and some will likely commit crimes, and since the state is inevitably comprised of these sinful humans, that therefore the trick is to find a way to have and maintain a limited state. So Benjamin Franklin also alluded to the problem of maintaining the limited state with his famous words following the Constitutional Convention, where he told a woman they had given Americans a republic, quote, if you can keep it. Right. And there's even a Latin phrase for this from the Roman poet satirist Juvenal in the early 100s AD, quis custodiet ipsos custodes who will watch the watchman another good slogan for a t-shirt maybe 
<laughs> so this dilemma is broadly recognized even among non-Christians, but Christians, especially Reformed Christians, should be particularly aware of the problem. Right. So Reformed Christians view this problem through the lens of original sin and total depravity. We know that from the time that Adam and Eve first sinned against God, human nature became thoroughly corrupted, spiritually dead in sin. And this is every human's condition from conception, except for Christ. Although not everyone always acts as sinfully as they could, we are affected by sin in every aspect of our being. This is called total depravity. And even for Christians who have been spiritually born again through Christ, there is a spiritual corruption that remains until death. So we have absolutely no illusions whatsoever about people being inherently good or that human nature can become sinless or there ever being a utopia or a millennial golden age or or anything like that, this side of God bringing the final judgment and his establishing the new heaven and earth entirely apart from human agency. I should add that if you, the listener, are interested in finding out more about the biblical teaching of total depravity and other key points related to a reformed view of the Bible's teaching about salvation, we'll link some introductory resources in the show notes. But the objection or claim you're responding to is that because humans are sinful and so inevitably there will be crime, we need not only civil governance to administer civil justice, but the claim is that a state is necessary for there to be such civil governance. On that point, you give a quotation from Robert Higgs and link to a video presentation and article where he discusses this more elaborately. What's his basic idea that you present? So Robert Higgs, who is now retired, but he was a senior fellow in political economy for the Independent Institute and also at the Mises Institute. One of his areas of expertise was in studying the compounding effects of monopoly governance in light of the nature of man. He says that human nature, being what it is, we openly admit that stateless civil governance would indeed produce what he calls a bad situation. That's just the inescapable human condition no matter what. But unlike Madison and Locke, who try to argue that a so-called limited monopoly state is the best, albeit not perfect, sort of arrangement for civil governance humans can realistically achieve, Higgs explains that any monopoly state inevitably produces a much worse situation than stateless civil governance. This is where you go on to discuss that a little, the fact that a state demonstrably increases rather than diminishes the destructive potential of sin. How do you say we can understand this in both principle and practical terms? Yeah, so the argument favoring even a limited state is based largely on a faulty assumption that without the state, there would be chaos and lawlessness. And Higgs shows that the monopoly state actually creates chaos and lawlessness as it inevitably grows. So as a coercive monopoly, the state has the ability to commit exponentially more harm than anyone would without that concentration of power. In economic terms, we would say violence is the state's comparative advantage. That is, it's what they're best at. And in part, because one, they don't have to limit their spending on violence, and two, because they won't permit anyone else to compete with them. So in other practical terms, if the state is supposed to be providing protection, that is defense against and restitution for crimes, it consistently fails to do it. In fact, not only do they fail, but our own Supreme Court has even said protection is not the job of the police. No doubt they might protect some people sometimes, but the state's practical ability to protect life, liberty, and property has been shown again and again to be highly unreliable and exists concurrently with crimes by the state itself. In terms of principle, if the supposed purpose of the state is to protect against aggressors, to protect the weak from the strong, then who protects us from the strength of the state? Minarchism, or a proposed limited state, has no solution to this problem. If we are at risk and need protection from crime because people are sinners, 
then giving a monopoly of power to a group of sinners is the absolute worst thing that we could do. Yeah, absolutely. I think some people have a hard time believing that point you made about the Supreme Court with reference to police. So we'll definitely have a link. They've done it like six times, I think. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm also reminded of Lysander Spooner's observation that the U.S. Constitution, which was supposed to found a limited state, Mm -hmm. either resulted in the government we have now or was entirely powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. Yeah. But you reference R.J. Rummel's documentation of democide, which is a term for basically murder by government, Mm -hmm. not including combatants in war. And in the 20th century, the number of people that governments have murdered is over 260 million. Mm -hmm. And this is six times more people than murdered in combat in all the foreign and internal wars in that same period. This is as though a nuclear war has occurred, but with those murdered spread over the century, this is what states have done. Besides the fact that the U.S. government seems to be trying this very moment to initiate an actual nuclear war. Yeah, that's right. It's amazing to me that we can easily acknowledge the murder that someone like Hitler committed, yet completely eliminate from our mind's eye that the state today is still capable of murder. Of course, Hitler is associated with World War II, and so murderous governments tend to only be seen in the context of war and really only in unpopular war. States, even those that are part of the United States, consistently fail to prosecute violent crimes and they prosecute nonviolent victimless crime instead. They spy on citizens en masse and extort property from the innocent through eminent domain and asset forfeiture policies. The complaints about so called systemic racism of white people can actually be laid squarely at the feet of the monopoly state and has little to do with racism. For example, Whites in New Mexico are a minority population, just in the population and in government, and we still face these same problems. Other examples can include bad regulation of products, such as with pharmaceuticals. While the opioid crisis was not the fault of doctors, those were drugs regulated and approved by federal regulatory agencies. So not only do states fail to live up to their supposed purpose, but as a matter of fact, They are the very worst perpetrators of crime in all of human history, including the present day. You know, it's so obvious. It boggles the mind that otherwise intelligent adult Christians are so, so naive, seemingly Mm -hmm. willfully naive about what states really and inherently are. But most reformed libertarians were once as naive and the whole point of our podcast is to do what we can to help. Yeah. In any case, you conclude your article by reiterating, in summary, how human sinfulness is therefore actually a reason against having a state and a reason for stateless or non-monopolist civil governance. Besides the fact that every state as a monopoly on the use of coercion and supreme decision-making or final say, by necessity, is inherently unjust because it involves enforcing its claim to exclusive control or prerogative over persons and property that belong to others and that the state does not own. How would you sum up your conclusion? Very simply, never concentrate power in the hands of sinners. And the state's monopoly does exactly this. So since civil governance is necessary for a functioning society because of human sinfulness and the inevitable presence of crime, then this turns out to be a reason against the supposed necessity of civil governance by the state. No doubt people will remain sinners and there will be crime, even if we lived in a free society with stateless civil governance without a state's coercive monopoly. Minarchists would agree that a state left unlimited leads to these horrible outcomes. And so they appeal to principles such as separation of power and checks and balances as a means of guarding against such problems. Libertarian anarchism takes these principles to their most consistent and prudential conclusion. And that is that stateless civil governance can significantly lower the ability of any sinner or group of sinners to wreak the horrendous level of crime we see from states. 
You'll sometimes hear people accuse the idea of stateless civil governance as being utopian. This accusation is based on false assumptions about anarchism or stateless civil governance, namely that anarchism assumes people are inherently good and so don't require law and order and everything will be puppy dogs and rainbows. But a consideration of reality shows that the idea of limiting any state is in fact profoundly unrealistic. Look at the situation we're in now. The U.S. and its particular states are simply not limited. From a Reformed Christian perspective, given human sinfulness, non-monopolistic civil governance is the best sort of arrangement sinners can have. Thanks for listening to the Reformed Libertarians podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute with Carrie Baldwin and Gregory Baus. See the website for each episode's show notes and sign up for our email list. Don't forget to rate and review Reformed Libertarians podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcatcher. Find our email and social media on our contact page at reformedlibertarians.com.